What's going on everybody, it's your boy Jimmy James 59 and today going to be kicking it with another Civilization concept overview. Today looking at Outremer, also known as the Crusader States. We have the standard fare for you when it comes to Civilization overviews. Going to do a deep dive here. I'll also include some arguments for and against including the Civ. Some maybe higher level Civilization ideas like strategies, strengths and weaknesses. And I'll also talk about some ideas that I thought of but just didn't really work for the Civ before I conclude. I would always like to start off telling you what this video is and isn't, and it's not a history lesson. I don't have the expertise or the amount of lifetimes to really give you a thorough deep dive in this format here on YouTube. Now, what I can do though is help us think about whether it would be a cool thing to have the Crusader States in Age of Empires 2. Can we make it a good save that'd be balanced, fun to play, etc. In addition to that, this video is actually coming out at a time when two other YouTube channels are printing out Uchimura Civilization Concepts, and that would be Robbie Lava and Iron Kaiser Gaming. Basically, we kind of all realized by accident that we were working on an Uchimura Civ concept, and we wanted to put them out at the same time. And what I want to do is actually encourage you to take a look at all three of them. As of this recording, I really haven't seen their videos, and I don't really know their designs, but I can tell you that I really think it will be worth your while to check out those two guys. In part because I think that Iron Kaiser does a really nice job uh, bringing to life the history of a civilization, and that would be something really exciting to look forward to. Additionally, Robbie has a lot of practice with game design, and I think he's kind of one of the OG civilization theory crafting guys on YouTube. He's a really heterodox thinker, really creative, and so uh, his design is probably going to look very different than either one of ours. And I will say for me, you know. If you watch my channel, you know I'm a lot more of a numbers guy. I really like to think about what a civilization's performance statistics look like, if it's balance, and essentially what it gets you. So I think that all three videos will be worth your time. Now let me give you a historical flavor for Outremer. What we're talking about here are essentially four interrelated Catholic polities centered around the Kingdom of Jerusalem, bringing in a mix of... of peoples from Europe, and also some Byzantine influence as well. This is a period of perpetual conflict. It's not always large scale, but there are numerous crusades and other wars going on at this time. When we think about how they fought, this is a well-armed, well-armored military. You have heavy cavalry as I think something of your centerpiece, but also fighting alongside crossbowmen in dense, perhaps less mobile sort of formations. But to compensate for that, you often saw Byzantine and Christianized indigenous people being used for a little bit more mobility, some of those sort of light forces to counter the foes of the Crusaders, right, which typically consisted of mounted archers and light cavalry. When it comes to where we kind of draw the line or the civilization uh, would end, so to speak, we can look at uh, 1291 with the Siege of Acre, uh, with the Mameluke dynasty uh, really marking the end of the Kingdom of Jerusalem and Outremer. Now, what I want to do here is tell you, you know, or at least kind of go back and forth between whether or not we should have the Civ in the game. And I want to start off with the first against argument. Outremer is not technically a people in this, the way that at least Age of Empires 2 typically likes to use it, right? When we think about the Japanese, the Lithuanians, the Ethiopians, that sort of thing. Now, I think the counter argument here is that AOE 2 is, I think, pretty inconsistent in terms of what a civilization represents um you know we have ai leader names are often dynastic or military leaders that you know to which people's may or may not have actually uh you know been subject to or even accountable to in uh, in the sense that we would think about it in in a modern landscape additionally age of empires has a lot of what i would call umbrella civs where it's a lot of people's kind of smushed into one um the best example of that was the indians that got broken up into four different civilizations and there's a lot of other civs in the game that people argue that that should happen to so i think that the four side says we could be a little charitable here now another against argument is that we already have a lot of civs in the game that did participate in the crusades so why specify the crusader states outright well you can make the argument that this is a pretty unique time and place and that the Crusader States themselves really do have their own unique identity and stories to tell. And probably the best evidence of that is that they're already in the game and other campaigns and scenarios. And so for that reason, it might be nice to actually build out a proper civilization and be able to play them on the ladder. 
And the last thing I'd say here for is that when we think about the Crusades, the popular histories there, there's a lot of potential for this DLC to sell. I will say as maybe somewhat of a caveat, I think you'd have to do it right. Um, you could have made this very same argument for, say, the Roman civilization. A lot of people know it. Um, but it hasn't really sold all that well, at least compared to some of the other DLCs. So again, I don't think it's a lock, but I think if you do it right, the potential is really high. And at the end of the day, I, my verdict here is undecided. Um, I think the history would be cool, but we probably want to think about how the civilization is designed, how it would play out, and then go from there. So I'll jump back to this topic once we reach the end of the video, so stick around. Now let's talk about what the Civ would look like. Well, there's a few themes here. One, I think having a strong Frankish influence would be good, but we want to make sure that we just don't clone the Civ. Fortunately, we can borrow from a number of tech trees that would have sort of been present in the region at the time, and also maybe draw on some Byzantine influence as well. I see this a lot more as a heavy military sieve that's really going to use uh, powerful units to gain an advantage and not so much winning based off their economy. Now that doesn't mean we can't give them economic bonuses, but we might just have to be a little bit more creative or maybe give the uh, bonuses that they do have that save resources, uh, make them a bit more situational so that you have to play in the military to utilize them. This also creates a challenge, right? We want the civilization to have strong units. But we want it to be competitive and yet also not overpowered. So we uh, we have our work cut out for us here. Now I want to get into these civilization bonuses. I'm going to rattle them off uh, in a summary fashion here, and then I'll cover each one individually. Uchermere is classified as a cavalry and foot archer civilization. And the civilization bonuses are as follows. Berries last 60% longer and drop off 10% more food. Foot archers gain plus one melee armor in each age. You have free devotion and free hoardings. The paladin upgrade does not cost gold. And the team bonus, foot archers have plus two line of sight. Let's get into your eco bonus here. Basically, what we want to do here is reflect this idea of uh, early on, initially, uh, you know, the Franks coming in, living off the land, and maybe bringing some of their survivability with them. Now, we can compare this bonus, I think, best with the tatters, right? Basically, Uchimer is going to get about a hundred, excuse me, 570 food more. And we can look at the tatter sheep bonus, which is giving you sort of a nominal plus 400 food, even though there's going to be a little bit of decay on those sheep. And then for each town turn, you put up plus 200. So, you know, I think these bonuses are similar. The tatter bonus is going to be giving you more food overall, but you can maybe get to that food a little bit earlier with Utremer. And what this does essentially is that it's going to boost your forager work rate because you're dropping off that 10% more food. This makes the gather rate slower than a hunter, but faster than a farmer. Now, there's a bit of a catch to this though, because one, remember if you're saturating the berries, which is something you might want to do with the sieve, villagers are going to bump into one another. So that's going to lower the work rate quite a bit. But the bigger issue is that berries are not often or not always rather in a position that's easy to defend so you're going to want to make sure on a map right you know you might be putting your villagers in a position where you need to say play more defensively or maybe you play more offensively because sometimes that's your best defense now let's talk about your military bonus with the foot archers gaining more melee armor this does two things one it reflects some history here with the foot archer being pretty common especially the crossbowmen in the crusader armies but it also helps us differentiate the civilization from the franks and that now we have a bonus incentivizing an archer opening which we don't really see with the franks all that often what does this do for you well in the early game this is a really nice bonus to be able to take on scouts but remember it's just melee armor so you're still going to be suffering the same fate versus skirmishers in the mid game and the late game versus knights you're surviving an extra hit when it comes to camels you're surviving maybe another hit or two more and that makes a lot of sense because Ultramere's foes would have been civilizations that have access to camel in the game so once again we're baking a little bit more history into the bonuses now coming up we have the free devotion and free hoardings right this is going to reflect that religiosity as well as the fact that crusader castles were a really important part of Uchimer's military strategy. So what's this going to give you? Well, this is going to help you make knights in the mid game. It's not perfect, right? Your knights can still be converted, but it's going to give you a little extra breathing room. And 
when it comes to the late game, right, um, Ultramare does not have the best economy. So free hoardings is going to mean that if you fall behind a little bit going to the Imperial Age and you are literally under siege, getting that free hoardings might help you keep that castle up and help you kind of come back into the game by having that durability, keeping map control, and perhaps you can push back some of those enemy trebuchets and win the treb war. And the last sieve bonus is that the paladin upgrade doesn't cost gold. What we want to do here is really make sure that the civilization is themed towards heavy cavalry, especially in the late game. And I think that this bonus does just that. It also gives us one of those situational kind of indirect economic bonuses. Knights are not always the play in your strategy, but we do want to make sure that, hey, situationally, if knights are what you're going for, we have a nice route to get there. Now, the upgrade's still going to be expensive because the Paladin upgrade costs a lot of food, but I think the biggest issue actually is the fact that, and I think this is actually under discussed in some cases where we focus a lot on the research cost of the Paladin upgrade. I actually think it's the research time that's probably the most salient here because what that does is it gives your enemy time to mass counter units. And while Paladin is being researched, you typically are not trying to trade a lot of heavy cavalry units, so you're not fighting. You're usually waiting for that research, uh, for that upgrade to come in, and that is just going to give your enemy more time, actually. And so oftentimes what happens is by the time you get Paladin in, your enemy has actually created a lot of halberdiers or a lot of heavy camel riders, and sometimes that means that Paladin doesn't wind up being the, the best investment. Also remember that the Cavalier upgrade is still going to cost gold. Taking a look at the team bonus here, Foot Archer's having more line of sight. What I want to do here is incentivize players not just to open with archers, but also keep archers in the army to fight alongside heavy cavalry. And one of the ways I'm going to do that here is make it a little different than the old Magyar bonus because I'm also going to include skirmishers. The extra vision here I think is nice. This was when it was the Magyar bonus, uh, though it, the Magyar bonus didn't include skirmishers. I always thought this was one of the most underrated. The extra vision really is nice for catching enemy units on your line of sight, maybe villagers trying to get away, and sometimes it can even help you prevent towers because those if they're coming up outside of your line of sight and you don't see it, you can't stop it, and that can slow a push down really fast. Additionally, this might be more of a low to intermediate <laughs> sort of a... Uh, uh, benefit, but just being able to see those mangonels a little bit earlier so that you can you know, decide if you want to run away, if you decide if you want to do split micro, that kind of thing, can be pretty good as well. And I would just say, I think the value of information in Age of Empires 2, it's difficult to quantify, but it's really valuable and this is going to help you. Now, when it comes to the unique units for the civilization, we can start off with what I think is going to be one of the bread and butter units for you, and that's the Templar. It's a heavy infantry unit that has a pretty decent cost to both in this unit cost and its upgrade. But for that, you're getting 75 HP in the regular version, 85 in the elite, 11 and 13 attack. So the same attack as a champion, but we're going to talk about some bonuses here in a sec. Your melee armor is pretty good. You can get three in the elite version, but have a base of two in the regular. Pierce armor as well. You can get that third base pierce armor when you research the elite. That is a really nice reason to upgrade this unit. It's not the fastest unit, but it's also not terribly slow either, so it can get around the battlefield. Now the bonus here is that the unit's attack increases in the presence of enemy military units, plus one per seven units to a max of plus four. And you also have a little bit of bonus damage versus Eagle Warriors, but now let's talk about their bonus. So what we want to reflect here is the fact that Templars were often outnumbered and, you know, they fought with a lot of religious zeal and piety. And so we want to try and build that bonus in so that they actually fight better when they're outnumbered. This is a mechanic that, of course, is similar to the Manaspa in Age of Empires 2, which gives units extra attack based on having uh, allied Manaspa and knights alongside them. But I think it's actually more balanced. The Manaspa mechanic winds up snowballing really hard because in Age of Empires 2, small advantages often lead to big advantages. But for the Templar, what this means is that as you're winning and you know getting an advantage over your enemy, you'll start losing some of those performance stats as your enemy's numbers go down. And so I think that that just probably reduces the uh, acceleration of that snowball effect. 
Now, what does the Templar give you? Well, it gives you a strong and durable unit, but it's kind of expensive. And that elite version, right, that seven pierce armor is really nice, but you gotta get there. What this means is that when you're up against not a whole lot of opponents on the other side, it's gonna be a worthy unit to research, but it's also probably gonna be weaker than some of the other infantry unique units we think about. Now, once the battlefield, right, gets a little bit bigger, your opponent has a bigger army, now you're probably only using to losing to those, you know, super strong melee units, especially ones that are doing uh, anti-infantry or anti-unique unit damage. Now, because, right, you know, those are probably not the best fights, that does mean that your bonus, right, you'll be a little bit more outnumbered, right? Your attack should remain high, and so I actually think Templars will probably perform a little better than folks might think. And what I want to do here is compare the Templars with, I think, two similar units, the Teutonic Knights and the Sergeants, based on, you know, some categories in terms of performance stats. Think about where they rank, basically just to show that I think that the unit is well-balanced here. So when it comes to melee damage, right, the Teutonic Knight is number one, but the Templar can, if you are up against a really big army, match that. When it comes to HP, the Templar is right in the middle, uh, really tying actually with the Sergeant, but the Teutonic Knight is going to take the cake there. When it comes to melee armor, right, both Sergeants and Teutonic Knights are going to have more. When it comes to Pierce armor, right, Sergeants are going to lead the way in that, but if you can get to the elite version of the Templar, you'll actually have one more Pierce armor than a Teutonic Knight. When it comes to speed, this is what the Templar is really cooking up for us here. It's definitely faster than both Teutonic Knights and Sergeants. When it comes to the unit cost, it's right in the middle. And when it comes to the upgrade cost, it's actually the most expensive. So what do we have here, right? Teutonic Knights, if you were looking for a unit just to get in there and fight, might be what you would go for. Sergeants, on the other hand, are gonna give you more durability. But it's not like Templars are any are bad in those particular areas. They're just kind of in the middle, usually, between those two units. Additionally, right, the elite upgrade is really crucial for Templars. And I think, given that, you, if you can make the investment, this is a unit that actually can be a your core gold unit in your late game comps. It's also the case when I talk about the technology tree, I will also show you that Utremer is a bit more reliant on Templars versus uh, the Teutons and Sicilians, which can make, both can make fully upgraded champions, even with some bonuses. Now, that's not all when it comes to unique units, right? We also have the Turkopolier. Now, I could have called this the Turkopole, right? Um, you know, my understanding is that Turkopolier is kind of lead Turkopoles, um, but I just like the sort of French way this sounded, and so I, that's why I decided to go with, right? Just for a bit more aesthetic flavor. But what's this unit gonna do, right? Well, it's reflecting these Byzantine and the Christianized indigenous people who would be incorporated as light auxiliaries into Outremer. It is a decent cost, but it's not terribly expensive. 70 HP in the regular version, 80 in the elite. It has a really low attack, but a decent rate of fire, though that still doesn't make up for having a low attack. No base melee armor, two pierce armor, so that's okay. It's quick, it's basically the speed of a feudal age scout, right? It's gonna be uh, faster than light cav, but it's gonna be slower than, say, a Shrebamsha rider, but so it does have some pretty good speed. The bonus of the Turkopolier is that you're doing bonus damage versus cavalry archers, and a little bit of bonus damage versus Spearmen to kind of bake in the idea of Parthian tactics, which the Sid, by the way, doesn't have. What I want to do here is think about how the Turkopolier matches up to camels and knights when it comes to fighting cavalry archers. Basically, Turkopoliers and camels actually kill cavalry archers in the same number of hits. Knights, right, because they're not doing bonus damage, are going to take a little bit longer. However, the Turkopolier, right, because of its low HP, dies to Cav Archers a little bit quicker than Camels, and definitely a lot quicker than Knights. Now you gotta remember here, Camels are also a good counter versus Knights, and Turkopoliers are losing against most of the units, and Knights are strong versus basically anything that's not a direct counter. Also keep in mind though, right, just so, you know, if it seems kind of underwhelming here, remember, the Turkopolier is much cheaper, it has a faster movement speed than both of those units, and it does have some rate of fire compensating a little bit for its low attack. We can take a look in the Imperial Age, and it's basically the same story. And so where do we wind up at the end of the day? Is that we have a nice unit that's maybe a 
bit ultra specialized, right? Versus cab archers, but it's not gonna be a bad raiding unit. You probably don't wanna summon town centers. And what I really think makes this unit so interesting, actually, if we say compare it to say like the Shravamsha Rider, which is good against all archers, the Turkopolier is really only going to be good versus cavalry archers and only if it can really get on top of them. So this is a unit that you want to play a bit more tactically with, right? And you might have to commit to a little bit if you're up against cav archers, but that's why it's not that expensive. Your first unique technology in the Castle Age is Knight's Hospitaller. And what this is doing is giving the Nightline plus two damage versus camels and plus two bonus resistance to cavalry damage. What you want to reflect that here is that Crusader Heavy Cavalry was really unparalleled on the battlefield at this time. And what is this going to give you? Well, in the mid game, Knights will defeat Camel Riders. Paladins in the late game will trade evenly versus Heavy Camel Riders. And you can survive one extra hit versus Halberdiers, which essentially is the same as Franks. If you take a look in the Castle Age, right? Ultramar Knights right, die in 11 hits to Camel Riders, and a generic sieve is going to die one hit earlier. And Ultramar Knights are also going to kill a Camel Rider in 10 hits, and it's going to take 12 for a generic sieve. So that's actually a really good bonus. Now you got to remember, right, this is something that you have to research. So it's not like you can just, you know, rock and roll in early Castle Age. This is probably something in late Castle Age if you can get there. When it comes to the Imperial Age, I mean, it's really just about as even as it gets. Basically, right, heavy camel riders kill paladins uh, in in, uh, in eight hits usually, but Ultramar paladins will die one hit later, and Ultramar paladins will kill heavy camel riders in nine hits, right? And usually it takes, once again, uh, ten hits overall for a, a paladin, uh, typically. So that really just makes it a purely even fight that we have here, right? Now remember, paladin upgrade with Ultramar, no gold costs, but it's still expensive, and you're paying for the cost for Cavalier. Heavy Camel Rider is, you know, about the same cost as Cavalier, so it's going to be easier for opponents to get to Heavy Camel Riders than Ultramar. But, hey, being able to trade against Heavy Camel Riders is no joke, at least generic ones. Maybe some of the top-line Camel Civs will still prevail in this matchup. All right, now I want to talk about the Imperial Age, and that's our technology, Curia Regis. And what it does is that it lets your non-siege land military units refund some of their gold cost, gold cost when they die, and the amount of that refund is dependent on how many relics you have collected, right? Basically, topping out at five relics, and that's 25% of a refund. What we want to do here is reflect, reflect the fact that Crusader states were pretty reliant, right, on some of these more powerful, well-armed units, and also kind of bake in a little bit of history with the hospital in Jerusalem uh, dedicated to John the Baptist that actually leads to the Knights Hospitallers caring for Christian pilgrims, right? We're going to just go ahead and since we already have the Knights Hospitaller as a technology, we'll bake it into the Imperial Age tech. And what this is really going to give you is that if you can collect enough gold, uh, enough relics, excuse me, um, you might be able to replenish your gold army better than an opponent. Now keep in mind, this is different from the Portuguese who are just saving gold, right? Crusader states actually have to pay that full upfront gold cost, and they're only getting the refund if units die. And I think one of the best ways to illustrate the effect that this will have is thinking about the night line. What I want to do here is look at a generic civilization and look at its relic income per minute, and think about what would happen if you lost two knights per minute, which is the number of knights that a one stable in the game can make over 60 seconds. So let's start off, right? If a generic sieve has one relic, right? You're bringing in 30 gold per minute, but if you're losing two knights per minute, you're losing 150 gold, and that means you're essentially down 120 gold. We can keep expanding this out, and basically, right, if you have five relics, a generic sieve is essentially replacing the gold income lost from two knights. Okay, so what is Curiaragus giving you for Ultramare? Well, for one relic, you're just going to be down 112 gold, right? So, you know, pretty similar, right? Not that big of a, not that big of a change. Two relics, you're going to be down 75 gold. Three relics, right? You're going to be down 38 gold. And at four relics, that's where you're going to even out. And at five relics, right? Even if you're losing two knights per minute, you're still going to have a little bit more extra gold in the bank. So really what this is doing, right? It's essentially moving up the replacement rate for the gold income lost from two knights at that point 
to four relics instead of five. Now remember, I can't emphasize this enough. You still have to pay full cost for units when you train them. So if you wind up not losing those units, you're not getting that refund. So this is really helping you out in those scenarios when you're finding yourself in a more pitched battle condition and you're having to trade lots of units on the battlefield. Now that we've talked about what makes the Civ unique, let's think about how their technology tree is organized. And yes, this is a Foot Archer civilization, right? Because we have a number of bonuses there, but your Foot Archers will, because you missed the last armor upgrade, lose versus generic fully upgraded versions, right? So the Foot Archers for Ultramare, right, I think are strongest in the early and middle stages of the game they're still going to be strong in the later stages as long as they're not up against maybe top tier archers you're gaining that melee armor so in the end you top out being plus two versus a generic sieve and you also have that line of sight when it comes to the barracks it's okay right however you are missing supplies and champions and the logic here right is we want to factor in the fact that crusader states did not always receive reinforcements at the best rate, and this is a, a a sort of military that could be difficult to sustain. Additionally, when it comes to gameplay, we want to see Templars in the battlefield, right? So this is going to help us get there. But keep in mind, you do have Halberdiers that are fully upgraded, which is nice. It's mainly done for balance purposes. Here, uh, basically every Paladin Civ has Halberdier, Heavy Camel, and as you'll see, the Civilization doesn't have Heavy Camel, so giving them a Halberdier I think is justified. And talking about the stable now, right? You're really pushed towards the night line. You get all the upgrades. You have unique technologies that definitely, you know, could benefit you there. And you're incentivized with the uh, no gold cost in the Paladin upgrade to really go ahead, right? Burn that food, research that unit. Now you do have light cavalry that are okay. You have plus four armor and bloodline, so that's good. But there's no Hussar, so definitely not top tier. And additionally, don't forget about the Turcopolier, right? If your opponent wants to make cavalry archers, you have a nice unit, but you know, keep in mind, it's pretty weak versus a lot of uh, other kind of units. So you're gonna wanna think about how you defend it when your opponent then decides to counter that unit. When it comes to Siege, um, I think I would best describe it as that you have some options, but no real power, no Bombard Cannon, Siege Onager, and Siege Engineers is also not there. This is a civilization that really wants to fight army v army. When it comes to the dock, well, you know, I had a little bit of struggle with this one. Crusader navies definitely had victories, but you have a lot of outside support coming in. So what I decided to do was basically give them a pretty open tech tree. Though keep in mind, uh, no elite cannon galleon and no heavy demo ship, right? And so this will be a sieve that you won't mind playing it if you random into it, say on islands in the ladder. But if you're saying in a tournament and you're you know you're up against you're going to be a really strong navy sieve, you probably want to pick something else. And also keep in mind, Curia Regis doesn't affect naval units. When we look at the castle, it's pretty darn solid. Remember, free hoardings is going to help you in those tread wars. And you know if your economy causes you to get up a little later than your opponents, right? Maybe you can hold on a little bit while you're under siege. And yep, all the other upgrades are available, so it's pretty good. You got a good monastery, free devotion is nice, all the techs are there, and the university is only missing Bombard Cannon and Siege Engineers. So again, a lot of a uh, lot of nice defenses here. Keeps with arrow slits will be nice, and heated shot will also help you with those Crusader castles, uh, you know, defending the city. The economy is not great, right? Um, again, trying to bake in the fact Crusader State's not exactly supplied very well, so uh, the no two-man saw, no crop rotation, but you do have your last mineral resources. The idea is, hey, given the civilization, pretty reliant on strong military units, and also we want to help you get those castles up. You're going to get those upgrades if you're willing to pay for them. Now that we've gone through the basics of the Civ, I want to think about the Crusader States on a bit of a higher level, and I'll start off with their strengths and weaknesses, then move into their strategies. When it comes to strengths, you have very good heavy cavalry here with a lot of versatility, and you do have a pathway to make them more affordable. Additionally, the foot archers here, especially in the early to mid game, are going to be pretty solid. Nice castles, good monastery. You actually have, unlike the Franks, a nice counter to mounted archer units. The Navy's got some things to speak for it here as well. Sneaky team game civ when it comes to being on the pocket. Maybe help counter some of those camel civilizations. 
and with the Templar, if you do need to go infantry, you have a unit that you can make. Now, when it comes to the weaknesses, your economy is not very good. Yes, you have a bonus early, but your mid to late game is really rough. And while the Paladin upgrade not costing gold is nice, it really only helps you if A, you research Cavalier, and B, you're really committing to the Paladin upgrade, which is not always the case in the 1v1. And so remember, it's still going to be a lot of food you have to spend and take a long time to research. Additionally, Curiuragus, right, is pretty situational as a unique late game tech. Also remember, your cavalry is still countered pretty well by spears. Again, it's going to be a little bit better than a generic Civ, right, because uh, similar to the Franks, and again, reflecting sort of Frankish influence, right? You're going to be able to take that one extra hit versus how the Deers. And remember that Knights Hospitallers also only letting your Paladins treat evenly versus Camel Sims. So top tier Camel Sims are still going to win those matchups. This, additionally, you got to keep in, keep in mind your Light Cavalry, decent, but it's still missing upgrades in terms of SAR. Your Foot Archers, while they're good in the late game, will lose to their fully upgraded counterparts. Mounted Archers probably don't even go there. No Gunpowder is actually a pretty big weakness as well. And your Siege is also not that great. Additionally, right, remember, you don't have Champion and you don't have Supplies, so even Two-Handed Swordsman might be something you don't want to make. So it's going to be, if you need Infantry, tough to mass. You're pretty reliant on the Templars and those castles staying upright if that's the way you want to go. When it comes to strategies here, right, think about the early game. The Archer Rush is going to be pretty good. Something to keep in mind, though, is that in the current meta, mills are often delayed so that you can go up a little bit faster. And that's where your eco bonus is coming from. So you can go for a generic Dark Age and try to take advantage of that bonus maybe a bit more in the Feudal Age. On the other hand, you might go for a slightly slower Archer opening, get more food, and gear upgrades faster. Additionally, I think Scout Rushing is still very much on the table. Yes, you don't really have any performance bonuses like the Franks with more HP, uh, but you know you are going to be able to get a little bit more food in there if you're willing to saturate those berries and you can defend them. When it comes to the mid game, you definitely have some options here. Knights with the free devotion, and even in late Castle Age, if you keep them alive, right? Knights House Biddler can be pretty good. Additionally, when it comes to the crossbowmen, hey, there's nothing wrong with this unit. Even in the late game, it's still pretty decent, but in the mid game, right? You're going to have that plus two melee armor, and if you want to hit and run knights, you have a unit that could do that fairly decently. Also remember, right, you have the Turkopolier, right? So if your opponent, you know, it's going to make cap archers, right? You have a unit that you can stick in there. Now in the late game, right, you know, Paladin plus some kind of ranged unit is going to be pretty good for you here. Um, you know, Curiaragus can help continuing to field double gold compositions, but only if your relic income is high enough. You're probably going to want either skirmishers or halves in most cases though additionally arbalist and halberdier can be decent also arbalist and light cav isn't bad as well your opponent's skirmishers because your arbalists are missing that last armor upgrade are going to be pretty effective so light cavalry is something you really might want to take into and the last thing i'd say is templar plus halberdier could be good but remember uh, that composition is countered pretty hard by hand cannoneers because they're both infantry units so you might want to think about adding in skirmishers maybe you know some light cab unit you know you're gonna have to just kind of think about what their unit comp is and go for it so you do have some options but you have to be careful and kind of summing up the strategies here i, I want to talk about some civilizations that i think that Uchimura are similar to so we can kind of figure out maybe where they rank a little bit and the first one I want to point you to are the Magyars, because both of these civs have a powerful military tech tree, but a limited economy as well. And the Magyars are a civilization that's got a lot more aggression early and a lot more mobility, whereas Uchimer, right, you have a nice food economy for those scouts, but you're probably going to want to open archers if you're not opening scouts, whereas some of the Magyars, you see minute arms to take advantage of free forging. Additionally, right, the Magyars have probably some of the best mounted archers in the game, and Uchimer, on the other hand, is got a counter to mounted archers so it's kind of two sides of the coin there magyar have uh, better trash units ultramare when it with curiaragus you're going to be able to possibly be able to replenish those gold intensive armies so again right uh, this is you know kind of two different sides of the coin here additionally it's worth keeping in mind that ultramare is using the old magyar team bonus but with the modification of also including skirmishers Additionally, I think you can compare the civilization with the Franks, right? Both civilizations are centric on their heavy cavalry, and they have good castles. 
Now, Frankish Paladins have that population efficiency with the extra HP. When it comes to Ultramare, right, you're going to be a little bit more cost efficient, right? So remember, now, Ultramare Paladins will lose to Franks one on one, right? Because, hey, Knight's Hospitaller is not helping you there, and it's just generic in that capacity. But also remember, when it comes to Cavalry, Ultramare is going to have Light Cavalry that's a little bit better, and you have the Turk Polier. Additionally, the Franks have the Throwing Axemen and Hand Cannon used to deal with Spears. When it comes to Ultramare, you're going to be relying a lot more on Arbalists and Skirmishers to fill that role in your army. When it comes to the infantry, Franks have fully upgraded champions, so you have a cost efficient and easy to mass unit in that capacity. When it comes to Ultramare, you're going to be using Templars, which are more population efficient than champions, but more difficult to mass. Frankish castles are cheaper, Ultramare has free hoardings, right, to try and survive that, um, that early Imperial Age power spike, given that you might be up later than other civilizations because of your economy. And speaking of economy, the Franks do have a better economy, uh, but what Ultramare have in their favor is perhaps more gold access in the post-imperial age. Now, you're not always going to have that. It's situational, but you might be able to, to get there, depending on how many relics you collect. All right, now what I want to do is talk about some ideas that I just decided didn't fit the civilization. First, I thought about giving the scout line more HP per age. Uh, basically, instead of having the Turkopolier as a unique unit, I thought about building that into the light cav. However, I felt that that just was suit too similar to the Franks and Feudal Age, and it just didn't seem unique enough for me. And it's also the case that I thought that with the Archer bonus, that would just be too overpowered. I thought about making the Turkopolier a mounted Archer, but I just kind of couldn't figure out how to balance it and also have it not look like a Genitor or a Camel Archer, essentially. I thought about the Light Cavalry specializing versus Cavalry Archer seemed good, as long as I could make it different than the Shravamsha Rider. And I think the fact that the Shravamsha Rider is a more generalist, anti-archer counter, whereas the Turkopolier is really specializing on cavalry archers, gives us enough of a, a distinct niche that the Turkopolier is filling. I thought about the Templar maybe conceiving of it as a mounted option, but I didn't want to compete with the knight line. And I also thought about a mechanic that could weaken the melee attack of your opponents. But I think that's incredibly difficult to balance, and I just preferred something that I could calculate a bit more easily. I thought about self-healing monks, um, but I, did, I knocked that one down pretty quickly because I think monks are already pretty strong, and that can become overpowered fast. So some more discarded ideas. I considered Curia Regus being a gold generation bonus. Um, I floated a few ideas, but it just seemed overpowered to me because I really think that the the economy for the sieve has to be one of the weaker ones in the game and a bit more situational and it just felt too general free heresy was something but you know what heresy is a thousand gold and that's way too much value i thought about the paladin skin somehow maybe changing the crusader knights but i think you could just accomplish that with a mod one of the ones i really want to actually take a little bit of time here is the civilization name itself Ultramare. Um, you could really go down a rabbit hole with this when you think about the etymology of it, but basically when we use Ultramare as a proper noun, it's a distinct and singular political identity. Um, and that's fused with what I would consider a pretty distinct religious identity as well. And I just felt really uncomfortable pluralizing that, right? It's when we think of the Crusader states, right, we kind of bake them into this, you know, this one idea, this one concept. Um, and it, it just doesn't seem right to me to try and take this name and pluralize it in some way to where we consider Ultramare, say, a people, right, so to speak, uh, in the way that other Age of Empire II civilizations are. I actually kind of like that it's singular, though I can understand why you might want to pluralize it so that it can kind of, you know, uh, you know, keep up with the Joneses, so to speak, in terms of the etymology of civilization names. But for me, right, I think it just uh, it just feels right to just keep it Ultramare. And that's it, folks. We've covered the Civ in great detail, so let's go ahead and summarize here. I think that Ultramare will be a really fun Civ to play from a historical perspective, but I think also in terms of gameplay, we have a pretty unique design here. We have a powerful military, and also one that's probably more versatile than you think. Now, this doesn't mean that the civilization is good in all matchups, right? I think gunpowder sieves are going to give you trouble. I think those really strong economy sieves can maybe get ahead of you and snowball their advantage. 
I would also think even though you have a nice anti-camel bonus in the Castle Age tech, top tier camel sieves are still going to give you a run for your money. The question with Ultramare though is going to be with your economy, right? Can you get to your powerful options given the fact that you don't have much of an early game economic bonus, especially, I mean, hey, if you get pushed off berries, you're kind of donezo when it comes to uh, economic bonuses, you're going to be just generic. And your late game techs are very situational as well. So again, right, can you get to those powerful units? Can you sustain that army? And for that reason, I think I like the balance here, right? Something that's interesting is here is you don't really even have any attack bonuses outside of unique units or technologies, right? Um, and, you know, you're really relying on durability, cost savings, that kind of thing to be able to really try and keep those armies alive and also keep producing them. Right. This is also right. You have nice, powerful options, but your trash is pretty mediocre as well. Right. So I think which is a civilization that you can struggle if you fall behind. But that's where a technology like free hoardings comes in, because, you know, you can maybe try and hold on just a little bit longer to try to get those upgrades in. Now, I think in the end, this really kind of uh, contours well to this idea of, you know, crusaders trying to retake the Holy Land. And having this real sense of urgency when it comes to doing so. So, this takes us to our ultimate question here. Should Ultramare actually be in the game? Well, I think that this design does do a good job of blending history with gameplay. And for me, it actually becomes kind of an issue. So, when we think about Civs in Age of Empires 2 DE, you advance through the ages, right? Dark, feudal, castle age, imperial, right? This is how we typically play. And while I don't think it's the case that, you know, every Civ has to map exactly onto that format, I do think most or maybe all of the civilizations have some kind of growth trajectory that mirrors or at least is similar to kind of how Civs go through the ages. And when it comes to Ultramare, it's just a Civ that I don't feel like has a sort of satisfactory uh, maturation in that way. You have a lot of people coming from, you know, uh, from Europe, external already kind of developed environments, and a lot of inputs from abroad here. And so for that reason, I think while Uchimer does have its own distinct political and religious identity, it really does just kind of feel like a two century military operation. And that might be because it kind of resembles that. So I don't know if this is fair, right? Um, you could say that because of that, Uchimera has less of an identity, but you also might say it actually has a more defined and concrete identity than other civilizations in Age of Empires 2. I like the history. I like the gameplay. I really do, right? You've watched this video. And yet at the same time, there's a part of me that can't help but feel like because of the fact that Ultramare is such a unique, uh, a unique player in world history, I'm still not sure if it belongs in Age of Empires 2. So I'll leave that to you in the comment section, right? What do you think? Is this a Civ that belongs in the game, or is this something that we should just, you know, kind of keep baked into all the other uh, European Civs and uh, allow them to just sort of, you know, be resigned to campaigns and scenarios and never hit the ladder problem. And that's the video, right? Hope you really enjoyed it. I'll definitely encourage you to go check out Robbie Lava, Nine Kaiser Gaming. In fact, I'm probably going to go to their videos right now and see what they're up to. So, hey, if I don't see you out there in the ladder, I'll definitely see you guys in their comment section. That being said, I'm Jimmy James 59 and I'm out. Peace.